All right. So welcome to Gay Youth Fighting Stigma Initiatives from Totally Outright. As most of you or some of you may know, Totally Outright is a leadership program. Uh, every year it brings together a group of 20 or so guys over a span of two weekends to uh, engage in the community and to build their capacity in doing so. We have on our panel five guys representing three different initiatives, programs, or projects that came out of the Totally Outright program. First we have representatives from Think Before You Type. This is a HIM campaign to promote healthy communication and positive online interactions again, amongst gay and bisexual men. We also have representative from Our Space, which is a youth-led initiative to support the health and well-being of young guys who like guys. And this initiative is based out of Toronto. Uh, we also have Gays versus Gays uh, joining us on our panel. Gays versus Gays addresses the issue of how stigma continues to reinforce intra-group isolation within gay, bi, queer, and two-spirit men's communities of Winnipeg. Uh, so first, I'm going to introduce you to the guys from Think Before You Type. We have Joshua Edward and Michael Quagg. <laughs> One second. But let's learn some more about these two guys first. Uh, Joshua Edward has worked in public health and social epidemiology for over two decades, almost devoted to issues that disproportionately impact gender and sexual minorities in both direct and indirect ways. Joshua has devoted his work to community-based participatory research and primary prevention, working with communities as diverse as gay, bi, and MSN sex workers to adolescents in rural and remote communities throughout Alaska. Joshua has developed his research skills in a variety of both community and public health settings, including the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. He now works as a Knowledge Translation Manager at Health Initiative for Men, where he works in partnership with the, with the community and partnering agencies to develop health promotion and HIV and STI prevention campaigns based upon the best available current evidence and scientific and medical recommendations. He is especially interested in developing campaigns and initiatives that support both evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence. And the integration of alternative forms of knowledge from the community. Joshua is also completing a doctoral fellowship at the University of British Columbia in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Michael Quagg is the knowledge broker of gay men's sexual health programming at Katy. He recently moved to Toronto from Vancouver where he, has, where he was working as the knowledge translation manager at the Health Initiative for, health initiative for Men. Michael has been involved in a variety of community-based and public health projects with gay men, such as Totally Outright, the CIHR team in, in the study of acute HIV infection in gay men, as well as a range of local social marketing campaigns addressing HIV and STI risk and vulnerability, including hashtag get guarded, talk to him, and just make sense. Please welcome Joshua and Michael. So Michael and I had a worst case scenario in which our final draft of our presentation on the thumb drive died five minutes before the presentation. So uh, what you're seeing here is the almost final version, but I will be skipping some slides that I had removed. Okay. So in 2015, uh, the Health Initiative for Men launched Think Before You Type, um, which really was, as noted, uh, designed and conceived by project participants from Totally Outright. Um, and it really is a first step to promote positive social norms in gay and bisexual men's communities, specifically in reducing online shaming and stigmatization around things like age, ethnicity, HIV status, body size, and masculinity. So today, what we hope you guys can take away from this is just to learn a little bit about some of the evidence that's out there around what online shaming and stigmatization can do to the health and lives of gay, bi, and MSM, uh, to review the history and the development of Think Before You Type, and to discuss some efforts to really start working to reduce stigma and create more inclusive online communities for gay, bi, and MSM men. Youth growing up today will see changes that earlier generations of lesbians and gay men would never have expected in their lifetimes, including politicians, business leaders, and educators who are openly gay, marriage between same-sex couples, and an evolving popular and artistic culture that provides many positive portrayals of lesbian and gay characters in movies and plays. 
Today's youth are able to use the internet to retrieve online information about LGBT issues, providing social networking opportunities and access to knowledge in a way that was never available to older cohorts. At the same time, young LGBT people searching the internet and interacting with their peers will be aware of the pervasive negative views of sexual and gender minorities. And I think while this quote probably was oriented towards thinking about coming across, say, overtly homophobic stuff and content on the web, I think it really also illustrates that sometimes queer youth, gay men, come out, they get online, and what they find are not necessarily communities that are any more inclusive than some of the communities that they had left. We know background and context-wise that uh, when people are isolated from families, for example, uh, gay youth are eight times more likely to have tried to commit suicide, six times more likely to report high levels of depression, three times more likely to use illegal drugs, and three times more likely to have risky sex. Family rejection due to sexual orientation increases risk of suicidality. Um, study of 224 self-identified LGB youth found that higher rates of family rejection were associated with increased rates of attempted suicide, high levels of depression, and risk behaviors. And I think these background quotes and statistics matter because, again, gay by MSM adolescents are coming of age in environments where harassment, bullying, are kind of everyday norms for many um, and are really directly related to physical and emotional health outcomes. And again, what are they finding online and are they finding anything really different in gay communities and especially those online ones? So we couldn't really get into all of the full range of some of the uh, things that we're trying to address with think before you type, such as body size, um, age, that, but there is some evidence around things, um, or specifically sexual racism. And I think sexual racism for any gay man who's ever been on a dating app, we've probably all seen it. Um, so what's listed as a, you know, somebody's preference, things like no blacks, no aboriginals, no Asians, um, of course, then including things like no femmes, no fatties, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're going to just talk about sexual racism specifically as an example. So sexual racism is a specific type of racial prejudice that's enacted in the context of sex or romance. Online people use sex and dating profiles to describe racialized attraction through language such as not attracted to Asians. Among gay and bisexual men, sexual racism is a highly contentious issue because of this idea that it's not racism, it's preference. So people will say, you know, like, I don't feel like I should have to apologize for the fact that I only like white guys. However, we know that the ways that men categorize or identify their preference in online interactions with other men has real potential for online or offline impacts. Um, we know that Asian and Pacific Islander men, for example, might be at elevated risk of HIV and other STIs because of cultural racialized assumptions that they should take receptive roles during anal sex. We also know that these same types of racialized assumptions are extended to other groups, such as Latino and black and gay and bisexual men. Um, and I had read a really, really great quote this morning and I couldn't find it. Uh, it was about the chemsex trend, which is happening in London, which is troubling because the rise in illicit drug use in gay men's communities is starting to set off a concurrent rise in HIV and STI rates. And they actually uh, interviewed a minority man who said that he had gotten into the chemsex scene because going to clubs, he had felt so much kind of racial stigma and attitude applied to his race that drug use was a way in which he really just could stop caring about the ways that he was treated by predominantly white men. Um, and then Further, it becomes an issue because somebody then, you know, is dealing with the stigma around drug use and possible STI testing and, uh, the, again, their status as a minority citizen. So there's not a lot of real evidence around what online shaming and stigmatization does to gay and by an MSM. Um, but, and again, why we kind of stuck to sexual racism, is there was a really, really great study that I think provides some context for why Think Before You Type is so important. 
So just a preference, study was a three-stage research project aimed at exploring race and racism uh, in the lives of gay and bisexual men in Australia. One of the authors was Martin Holt, who was actually here um, in Vancouver presenting at St. Paul's uh, on a different topic. But basically what they were trying to do was they were trying to see if the ways that gay, bi, and MSM men identified, again, this idea of racial preference on their profiles, how this corresponded with their uh, ideas around race and um, culture in their everyday life. So they took a standard instrument that's used to measure kind of everyday racist attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, and then they built on top of that some very specific questions around how they use language within their dating profiles. So 252 men, or 12%, reported that their profiles were very inclusive of race. 133 of the respondents reported that their profiles were exclusive on the basis of race. Um, and 3% reported that they had exclusive discrimination on the basis of race within their profile. So interestingly though, half of the men surveyed, 58% believed they'd been discriminated against on sex and dating websites because of their race. And nearly all men, so 96%, recalled viewing profiles that engaged in some form of racial discrimination. But then it gets weird and messy and complicated around trying to tease out th these men's beliefs and behaviors because 64% agreed that it was okay to indicate a racial preference online. 43% reported being bothered by seeing racial, racial exclusion in online profiles. 46% reported not being bothered. So you have this thing where the majority of them are bothered by racist content, but the majority of them also think it's okay to state a racial preference. So there's a disconnect happening between what they perceive to be racism and what they perceive to be a preference. And again, not really a surprise, but those who've never experienced racial exclusion were the least bothered by seeing it online than those who had experienced it. Gay, bisexual, and other same-sex attracted men maintain diverse but generally tolerant attitudes towards sexual racism online. Reflecting some of the debate around this issue, it appears that many men do not view racial discrimination between sexual partners as an act of racism. We found similarities between attitudes towards sexual racism and attitudes towards multiculturalism generally. These similar similarities suggest that sexual racism is closely related to more general patterns of racism. So in other words, what they found were that the men who identified strong racial preference in their online dating profiles, when it came to the other indicators on the test or the survey, identified racist attitudes towards other areas of their life. So what we're seeing as a preference within these individuals in one capacity, in another capacity, very clearly is just racism, which starts to beg the question, is it a preference or is it racism? Society is generally pretty com comfortable condemning racism, but there is a surprising reluctance among people, gay or otherwise, to challenge racialized sex and dating practices. And I think uh, I don't know if all of us have had this discussion, but I certainly have had this discussion with a lot of people, friends included, who say, I don't understand why I should have to defend the fact that I'm just not attracted to a certain type of individual. And I think there's no, of course, explaining why any one of us might be attracted to an individual. Um, you know, we like who we like. I think what we're trying to get at with Think Before You Type is addressing this idea that automatically you just exclude wholesale entire segments and categories of our population from people that you might like if you actually had a chance to know them. And again, 50% um, of participants felt racism was a problem, but only 64% but felt it was acceptable to indicate racial preference in a profile. So really, are we thinking about like reluctance? Is it that we're reluctant to address this issue within the gay, bi, and MSM community? Or are we really not aware of the fact that, you know, stating an online racial preference is a type of racism? And this all frames how we started to think about developing Think Before You Type, because we can't really, we can't start at step five of the intervention. We really need to start at the very, very groundwork and raise that awareness. So Think Before You Type really fits kind of a basic format of trans theoretical model of change, which I won't read through the entire slide, but basically says, you know, you can't skip steps within social change. 
whether you're talking about individuals or an entire population-based health intervention. Um, people have to go through things step by step. And while the time they may have to be in a certain step is flexible, they do have to go you know, through all those steps. Um, and it's important also to recognize that from the trans-theoretical model of change, you have to design things that really can appeal to an entire population, not just the minority, around 20% of uh, the population that is actually ready to take action. So there's really the five stages of the trans-theoretical model of change. So we've got pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. And I think Think Before You Type really was created for number one, you know? It's obviously not aware, or not recognized as a significant problem within our community, uh, this idea of sexual racism or online racial preference statement. So we're really just trying to get to that very, very first, no, it's not me, and get those individuals to recognize that, yes, it might be you. So Michael is going to talk about the specific development. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thanks, Joshua, for providing that uh, background or uh, on some of the research uh, that's available uh, on the topic of sexual racism. I, one thing that I just want to preface is that um, you know this research that uh, Joshua has compiled was not necessarily used to help inform the development of uh, Think Before You Type. Um, and just to kind of uh, give some background on the process um, and bringing it back to the theme of this uh, panel, um, this campaign and the concept for it really emerged from Totally Outright, uh, which for those of you who aren't aware is a 40-hour uh, sexual health leadership course for young gay um, men in Vancouver, Toronto, Winnipeg, and uh, now Ottawa as well. Uh, so one of the things that uh, participants in the program are introduced to at the start of the project um, is uh, the development of a team project. Um, and this is uh, some kind of campaign or um, program or project that um, groups of uh, Totally Outright participants uh, feel is a priority and um, um, you know requires some kind of intervention or some kind of uh, programmatic response. Um, and in 2014, um, him had uh, inspired by um, an, uh, an innovation at uh, at Winnipeg, which actually took on a. Uh, graphic designer to work with uh, these participants on developing uh, concepts and creatives for different projects. So um, last year for the program we had a, prof a professional designer come in and workshop with the different participants on you know, how they could turn their um, um, their ideas for developing different projects or campaigns and actually work with them to develop some creative to go along with that. And then we also had uh, one of the uh, Totally Outright participants work as a coordinator around the process. So I uh, think Before You Type uh, was selected for um, future uh, creative development. Uh, there were a few other uh, concepts that were kind of considered by the participants, but I think Before You Type emerged as kind of the favorite of the group. And it was inspired by the Don't Let Shame Decide campaign, which was developed by the Totally Outright group in Winnipeg. Um, and you know, I think this is just like one of the most amazing things about Totally Outright um, that we're seeing um, today is that um, you know the ideas that are emerging from the program are um, th they're really rich and they're um, you, you know there's so much potential for for them in, in terms of having an impact and you know now we're seeing uh, these ideas come through as campaigns so uh, this is just a mock-up uh, from our website, uh, which um, the tagline for those of you who can't see is, uh, what you type m might be saying more than you think, and includes you know, some language that's uh, somewhat typical on uh, sexual networking sites like mask only, no fat, no femme, no Asian. Um, and you know, this was uh, the kind of, 
the goal of the the team project in Tolia, right, was to develop the overall concept. But um, there was an actually um, uh, content to go along with that, and so. Um, we received uh, some funding in late of last year to develop uh, this concept into an actual campaign. And, um, you know, our, our main goal was to just increase awareness of stigma and discrimination that was taking place in online communities. And so, uh, but, you know, this created a number of challenges for us. One, um, you know, how do we position him uh, on this topic of online stigma, you know, a topic that's, um, you know, highly controversial and sensitive and complicated? Um, and this was an area that um, him hadn't really developed any uh, defined uh, positions on the topic and so um, you know and as Joshua mentioned we you know recognized that we needed to uh, like that you know this campaign was in, in some ways just kind of a first step in, in terms of raising awareness that this is an issue affecting um, gay men in Vancouver. Um, so in terms of uh, content development uh, we really want to make sure that uh, the content that we were putting into the campaign was accessible, that you know, um, wasn't too academic, um, and you know, ensuring that you know, gay guys across Vancouver could really engage in this topic. Um, and you know, it wasn't exactly a traditional campaign per se, because uh, one, we didn't really have um, um, enough guidance from the community around exactly how we should be crafting key messages, and so we want to just present the issue of shaming behaviors and stigma um, and, you know, with the goal of trying to create some community dialogue uh, among gay men about stigma that's taking place online. Um, and instead of um, developing our own um, messages and uh, content um, through the campaign, um, you know, we recognized early on that there was a lot of actually interesting and relevant third-party content um, out there in the internet. And so the focus was really on curating relevant content and trying to uh, uh, share different resources that were um, good and separate them from the bad ones. So in March 2015, we launched the campaign. Uh, included a, a campaign website, I think before you type .ca. Um, but we spent most of our activity um, in terms of content um, in, in, in our Facebook page. And, um, and again, like instead of uh, writing out, you know, uh, a comprehensive, um, you know, set of copy to go along with the campaign, uh, we wanted to just identify some good resources and articles and videos uh, that were produced by other uh, groups and, and link them to our Facebook page. Uh, we promoted the campaign through Grinder and Jacked, and uh, yeah, I've already uh, touched on the campaign content. This is just a screenshot of our website, which um, links and houses all the different uh, posts that go up on our Facebook page. And Joshua's just going to quickly uh, talk about uh, next steps. So kind of just to wrap up, building on what we hope to do is we want to continue using the Think Before You Type platform, but do it more strategically and really start to promote moving to that next step of positive social norms. Um, so thinking about things like hosting some community dialogues around experience with online stigmatization and shaming type language, um, further develop some met Metro Vancouver specific campaign materials, uh, both web-based and hard copy promotional materials, maybe do something multimedia. The video out of Winnipeg's Totally Outright group was amazing. Um, should all check it out. Uh, what's the title of it, Jared? Uh, don't Let Shame Decide. Yeah, Don't Let Shame Decide. Websites. Yep. Um, and then do some facilitator and advocate training so that people have some tools to take this themselves uh, out into the community. And that is it. Some preferences? I think questions at the very end. Right?